Welcome everyone. Today we are going to discuss ancient China from Song to Zhou. Let's first of talk about the, the scope for the China unit. We're going to go from the last Song King, which is 1105 BCE, to Emperor Wu Han, 88 BCE. Now this could change over the course of the unit. We could narrow the scope a little, but basically we're going from China from the end of the Song to China at the middle of the Han when it becomes a global power. The unit question that I want all of you to think about throughout this unit is, can one person change the course of empire? So as you notice in terms of the bottom, pi the bottom pictures, on the left you have modern China, while on the right you have the China that we're going to talk about. Notice how much smaller it is. Um, it's pretty much only the pretty much the southeastern part of China along with some stretches across basically northern Tibet in the middle between Mongolia and Tibet. This is what we're going to focus on in the China unit. Let's get started though just uh, to talk a bit about the Song Dynasty. Those who covered the Song, Song Dynasty earlier in our year should have the advantage because they should know a bit about it. The system of government is both a theocracy and an absolute monarchy. So it's a theocratic absolute monarchy in which the king basically is the descendant of the highest god and represents uh, the God and religion itself. They are the high priest, essentially, as well as the ruling king. Later Song kings believed that they were descendants of the highest Gang, Song Di. Song Di, by the way, is now the term for basically the Christian god. The symbols of power of the Song dynasty were the nine tripod cauldrons and the king. The nine tripod cauldrons is essentially a cauldron sort of like the one on the lower left as you see over here it nine of them represent the nine areas that they controlled they were supposedly created by Yu the great of the legendary Sha dynasty and the Song dynasty has these tripod cauldrons and that is the literal manifestation of their power the king is also a symbol of power in the Song Dynasty as well, for obvious reasons. Here's an interesting fact. China has a really early five-star general and high priestess by the name of Queen Fu Hao. She is the earliest confirmed non-Egyptian female military general. And uh, this is pretty significant. And we know this because she has a ton of battle axes in her tomb and there are oracle bones literally stating that basically the gods want her to lead the armies to face a barbarian invasion or to face any rebelling neighbors so Fu Hao was a very important military figure in early China plus she was female and that is always significant Let's talk about their military. They use bronze weapons mostly, as well as chariots. In terms of their record keeping, they had a sophisticated written language that we know as basically ancient Chinese. They would use divination through oracle bones, and that is pretty much most of what we can gather in terms of their writing. Divination, by the way, is trying to communicate with the gods to answer uh, life's questions. So that one guy that everybody remembers from this dynasty is a, someone known as King Di Xin, and he is the last king of the Song dynasty. Here's our menti question. Who are the worst leaders in the history of the world? Think about this, ponder it. The menti.com code probably will expire by the time you watch this presentation, but uh, think of it regardless. 
7.1 How a Wine Pool Led to the Longest Chinese Dynasty. This is pretty much directly related to the homework with the same title. So feel free to open that up as you listen to this presentation. Our main villain is Di Xin of Song. He is the last ruler of the Song Dynasty. Historians hate him, and you'll see why soon enough. The only positive aspects of him was that he was an expert debater, and he was so strong he hunted with his bare hands. But let's talk about why he's hated. First, he instituted, he instituted high taxes, and he used those taxes to build a wine pool and a meat forest, as you can see on the upper right. So the, those wine pools and meat forests were for his own private use. He had a lot of workers working in there. You raised a lot of high taxes, and what he basically did was he and his guests would party in the wine pool, and then when they got hungry, they would eat meat kebabs from uh, trees planted around the pool. So hence why I call it a wine pool and a meat forest. Let's talk more about his bad deeds. He ripped his uncle's heart out. So basically, Di Xin's family objected to a lot of his decisions. And uh, one time his uncle objected to what he was doing. So in response, Di Xin was like, you know, I wonder if your heart is different from other people's hearts. And at that point, he literally ripped his uncle's heart out to check it out. Historians have not answered the question on whether his uncle's heart was different because, well, that, that's not the important part. The important part is he literally killed his uncle. He's a kinslayer. Di Xin also invents execution methods like the burning pillar punishment. Basically, you have a balance beam above a pit of fire. So the execution method is having a prisoner stand on that balance beam with their bare feet as the fire rages around him. And as his uh, feet get essentially hurt due to the burning, because the balance beam is going to be hot, uh, the prisoner then falls down into the pit of fire and dies. Di Xin also was a possible cannibal. And this was something that was possibly invented by later historians. He also has an equally cruel wife who may be a nine-tailed fox demon. And a picture of that is uh, towards the bottom right. As you can see, you have uh, the, the Queen of Song, uh, who apparently has a nine tails. And that's sort of the beginning, actually, of the nine-tailed fox demon from Japanese mythology as well. Here's a spoiler. Di Xin is the last king of Song. And here's another spoiler. Spoiler. He dies of unnatural causes. And you'll learn exactly how soon enough. Your second Menti question is, who are the best leaders in the history of the world? The Menti code probably will expire as you answer the question. But think of this question regardless. Once you're ready, feel free to move on. The Zhou Dynasty founder, Ji Tang, the King Wen of Zhou. So Ji Tang was also known as King Wen of Zhou because, uh, well, he never declared himself king. We have a term for that, and it's posthumous. So he's a posthumous king uh, because he was still technically a count uh, by the time he died. It was only later that he was declared king after his death. He was the regional ruler of Zhou, which was a state during the Song Dynasty. In terms of leadership, he was the complete opposite of Di Xin. He inputted reasonable taxes, he loved his family, he didn't kill his family. He also had an equally wise wife and ten children from that wife. He was a diplomat and settled disputes between different lords. And he was a very competent general, too. All in all, Ji Tang was a pretty awesome guy. And it's a paragon of virtue that a lot of Chinese philosophers reference as what we know as a sage ruler, essentially a wise ruler. 
So eventually he was imprisoned by Di Xin, but because he was so awesome, um, Di Xin's ministers bribed the king to let Ji Chang go. So in other words, King Wen was so awesome that he was released and even rewarded by Di Xin. But he was a very, very kind person. He gave land to Di Xin in order to repeal the Burning Pillar punishment. He did this in order to, he sacrificed his own land, his own possessions, in order to save future countless people from this horrible punishment. He had a couple of famous sons, King Wu of Zhou and Dan, and, or shall I say Dan, the Duke of Zhou. Let's talk about the rise of the Zhou dynasty. So, Di Xin releases uh, King Wen. So, King Wen plots his revenge. First, he recruits a 72-year-old fisherman named Jiang Ziya, and Jiang Ziya becomes the prime minister. If you want to learn more about him, please do 7.4. He is a very fascinating person, one of the most intelligent people in Chinese history. You should learn more about him. Through diplomacy and war, Ji Tsang eventually controls two-thirds of the Song Empire. But he dies before he could launch his invasion against Di Xing. So it would have to be his son, King Wu of Zhou, that would defeat the Song Dynasty in the Battle of Mu Ye in 1046 BC. Meanwhile, Di Xin lights his palace on fire, knowing the end was near. He did not want to face punishment for his crimes against humanity. Thus, he fatally attempts suicide. The Song Dynasty thus ends in 1046 BCE, and that is also when the Zhou Dynasty begins. King Wu's reign. So let's talk about his reign. He first spares Song royalty gives them land to govern. In order to make sure that those Song royalists, the relatives of uh, Di Xin, don't rebel, King Wu appoints three brothers to make sure that uh, those Song royalists behave. He also had an interesting administration. Of the ten main ministers he had, nine were male and one was female. And this is interesting because this was a very rare occasion where you had a female be a part of the ancient Chinese government. As you'll see later on, there are very few female ministers in uh, dynastic Chinese history. So this was very interesting. Now the female could have been his wife or his mother. Historians aren't really sure, but we know, we're pretty sure he had a female in his administration due to the Analects, which is um, the one of the main books for Confucianism. Let's talk about the system of Gov or not, because he suddenly dies two years into his reign in 1043 BCE. So the next question I want you to ponder now is, would you have a 13-year-old run a kingdom? And the reason why I ask this is that King Wu's son, at that point in time, was 13 years old. Once you're ready, feel free to move on to the next slide. So, as expected, a civil war occurs. Let's talk about the background. King Tung, the next king of Zhou, was 13 years old. And... The Zhou court did not believe that King Tsung could be a good ruler at that point in time. So they had Dan, the Duke of Zhou, and the uncle of the king be appointed the regent. A regent, by the way, is someone who takes over political decisions of a ruler. Now this made the Song royalists upset because they saw that King Wu, the guy who conquered them, died within two years. And the Song royalists were like, you know, we're the descendants of Song Di, the highest god. We should get our land back and we should rule our dynasty again. 
because this whole thing about divine right after all. Do you know who else was upset? The three uncles overseeing the Sun royalists because they wanted to be regents for King Tung as well. Why choose Dan, the Duke of Zhou? So, the three uncles coordinated with the Song royalists, and as a result, you have the rebellion of the three guards. And as you can see, it's a pretty serious rebellion on the right. So basically, the green are the Zhou dynasty, the red are the rebels. As you can see, there are a lot more rebels than Zhou loyalists. But because of the brilliance of the Duke of Zhou and Zhang Ziya, they squashed the rebellion within two years. It wasn't even, it wasn't even close in terms of the rebels winning. As a result, the three uncles were punished. One was executed, one was exiled, and one, I believe, was imprisoned until the rest of, for the rest of uh, his life. Meanwhile, the surviving Song royalists were sent to govern frontier borderlands, basically the Zhou outskirts, not a fun place to govern, and also far away from the main Zhou court to eliminate their influence. That was 7.1. Let us now move on to 7.2, the Feng Jin system. And basically, this system uh, is covered in the homework. Now, in the homework, the first page is a thought exercise, basically imagining if the United States underwent a civil war, the Constitution gets ripped up, and you are now in control. So basically, that exercise asks you, okay, think of how many friends and family, how many trusted friends and family would you delegate land towards to help govern your empire? Uh, and and basically that is essentially what that exercise is all about. Once you are done with that exercise, that's when you start learning about a similar system known as the Feng Jian system, which is essentially what you did in terms of the what was it the first two pages of that homework assignment. Let's talk about the Feng Jian system. The Duke of Zhou implements this, and here is the ruling hierarchy. On top is heaven, then the king of Zhou, then the regional rulers known as the Zhu Ho. Then you have the ministers, grandmasters, and servicemen, but we're going to focus primarily on heaven, the king of Zhou, and the regional rulers. Let's talk about heaven. Heaven is its own kingdom, so unlike say like a Judeo-Christian uh, religion, basically heaven is its own active kingdom. Everything below heaven is all under heaven, otherwise known as Tian Xia. Heaven communicates mysteriously and this can be done through divination, such as uh, basically you would communicate with heaven using oracle bones, grain and animal sacrifices, heaven can also send in ghosts, natural disasters, and you can also have witches, uh, basically gender neutral term, by the way, witches, uh, witches could communicate with heaven as well. If the king was wicked, heaven would sometimes intervene through natural disasters, meteors, uh, pestilence, and stuff like that. The difference between the Zhou dynasty compared to the Song Dynasty, is that heaven no longer aids wicked kings. And this is important as we talk about the king of Zhou. So, king is a general neutral, neutral term in uh, China. In Mandarin, the king is also known as Wang. If you take a look at the Chinese character on the right, the top line is heaven, the middle line is humanity, the bottom line is Earth, and the line connecting all three lines is the king, basically that vertical line. The king of Zhou is no longer descendant of a god. Instead, he is now known as the, or they are now known as the son of heaven. And I, and I said he for a second because most 
kings in Chinese history, most rulers were male. So that is why I said he, but technically king is a general neutral term. So a king had a mandate of heaven. Basically, and what that means is that they were the representative of heaven. They represented heaven's will instead of being like a descendant of heaven. The son of heaven is a somewhat misleading term um, because as a king, you're, you're not supposed to do whatever you want. You're supposed to do your best in representing heaven, earth, and humanity. If you don't, then, uh, then uh, rebel, rebellions could happen and your ruling family could be replaced. If that happens, then you have a new dynasty. So here are the warning signs of being replaced. You could have natural disasters, successful rebellions, famine, and other causes. So kings were typically male. The king of Zhou also owned territory themselves. They have their own army. One question that I have for all of you is, do we still use natural disasters, famine, and wars as reasons to remove leaders or change leadership? Once you're done thinking about that, we're going to move on. Let's talk about the regional rulers now. So this system actually existed since the Song Dynasty in terms of regional rulers. They're also known as dukes, counts, and earls in terms of if you want to translate their titles to English. The King of Zhou appoints regional rulers, and these regional rulers were typically the relatives of the king or trusted people, such as Zhang Ziya, the prime minister of Zhou. It was a hereditary position. And regional rulership was a hereditary position. So if the ruler dies, if the regional ruler dies, then, it, then the title would go to the regional ruler's offspring. There's no official contract between the King of Zhou and the regional ruler. This is what makes the Feng Jian system unique compared to, say, like European feudalism, where in European feudalism, you have a very intimate uh, contract between the king and the lords. Not so in terms of uh, the Feng Jian system. The regional rulers had really high autonomy. A way to understand this is to think of the state of Wisconsin compared to the federal government. The state of Wisconsin has their own uh, regional ruler by the name of the governor. The governor executes the will of the people through the legislature and they have their own tax codes and a lot of their own rules and stuff like that. The main difference between a Zhou regional state compared to our United States is that the Zhou regional states actually had more power, more autonomy. They had their own, uh, let's see, yeah, they had more autonomy because, because, uh, because they didn't have a contract, after all, with the King of Zhou. Wisconsin has a contract with the federal government through the Constitution. Regional rulers would pay tribute to the Zhou Kingdom, and they were also expected to help Zhou because they were family, after all. There were as many as 71 regional lords uh, at one point in time in the uh, Zhou dynasty. And that's a lot of regional lords, if, if you think about it. One question that I would like to ask you is, would you rather be a king or a regional lord? Once you're done answering that, let us move on. So dynasty tax systems. So that is 7.5, that's a Meidu, but it's still interesting regardless because Zhou implements what is known as a progressive tax system on regional rulers. The more you own, basically, the more percentage of tax you pay. In other words, dukes paid more tribute, as in 50% of what they earned, compared to earls, who would pay like 25% of what they earned. And the U.S. has this progressive tax system for everyone. 
Um, uh, so yeah, that's a neat factoid about the Zhou dynasty tax system for the regional rulers. Now they had a different system for uh, everybody underneath the rulers. So the regional rulers would implement various tax systems for the people that they would govern. They had different systems. They could have implemented a well field system where eight families are in sort of like a tic-tac-toe community as you see on the bottom right. Uh, so there were eight private land spots and then in the middle land everyone every family works and whatever crops are grown in the middle uh, public land is sent to the regional ruler as tax regional rulers also could have done a family tax system where families are taxed individually and this was usually a food tax or they could have done a corvée system in which there's no conventional tax, but each person had to do mandatory labor for a certain time per year. And most of the time, these were uh, men because you had to leave somebody behind to manage the home and the farm um, when you had laborers leaving the farm. But what about the Duke of Zou? After the government was set up, he returned power to King Sun Zhou. Basically, he retired. He wrote a book of poetry and is a paragon of virtue in Chinese history because instead of maintaining power and essentially becoming a de facto king, he returned power to his nephew. And that's what makes him a paragon of virtue. He becomes the obsession of Confucius because Confucius often dreams about the Duke of Zhou and uh, the Duke of Zhou you could say is the hero of Confucius, somebody Confucius admired. 7.2, let us talk about 7.3, the king who cried wolf. So everything was going fine for the Zhou for about 250 years. There was an earthquake that occurred in 780 BCE, but if you have a competent dynasty, they could work through that. And then King Yozo decides to ditch his first queen. And he also had a son with that queen, so he also ditched uh, him as well. Because he saw a person by the name of Bao Si, a very pretty individual. He makes her his concubine, and then eventually she becomes the new queen of Zhou. The thing about Bao Si, though, was Bao Si was a very serious person. She never laughed. The Zhou king wanted to hear her laughter by any means necessary. So what the king does is he lights warning beacons, summoning every regional ruler to help him against an invasion. It's actually a troll job. A troll job. There was no invasion. He essentially made a fool out of every single regional ruler who came to his aid. And as a result, Bao Si laughs. Either because it was hubris, or because it was sad, or maybe both. Meanwhile, remember that first queen that King Yeo Zhou ditched? So, by the way, the king keeps on trolling every regional ruler, and so he keeps on doing the same thing over and over again. Meanwhile, the first queen's relatives are very angry, right? Because not only was the first queen ditched, the first queen's son, the potential heir of Zhou, was passed over for, rulers, for potential rulership as well. So, they partner with the Trenrog nomadic civilization to invade the king Yeo of Zhou. I want you to predict what happens next. Uh, this is fairly logical. Uh, it sort of hints at the title of this, The King Who Cried Wolf. As you could expect, no one helps King Yozo. He's killed and, well, Baus's son, the new heir of Zhou, was killed as well. Baus also dies, perhaps fatally attempts suicide as many historians suggested but uh, she no longer appears in history. The first queen's son, meanwhile, becomes the new king of Zhou, and he moves the capital from Haojing uh, to Luoyi because Haojing was the place that they invaded and sacked 
and well essentially the Chenrong, the nomadic civilization they did not want to leave the Haojing area they stayed there so well uh, the new king Zhou decided to permanently move the capital to Luoyi. Western Zhou Postscript Historians divide Zhou into two periods, Western Zhou and Eastern Zhou. Western Zhou ends with the moving of the capital in 771 BCE. Kind of sad, right? You have 250 years of good things, and then one king decides to go uh, fool around with another person, and as a result, you have the end of a period of a dynasty. This new capital of Luoyi, now known as Luoyang, it had less farmable land. And what that means is that there was less troops that the Zhou Kingdom could deploy themselves. They had to rely more on the regional rulers for help. And well, good luck doing that in the near term after uh, the old king trolled them uh, with those beacons. So thus you have a weaker Zhou Kingdom, a weaker central government. And this will become significant as we talk more about the Eastern Zhou period. Meanwhile, a regional state actually takes back west, the Western Zhou area from the Chenrong. This state is known as Qin. Now remember that state of Qin, uh, as you possibly could infer, Qin eventually uh, would uh, inspire the name China, which is China. So remember that factoid. Meanwhile, that is the end of the presentation from Sound to Zone. I hope all of you enjoyed it, and I hope you have a good rest of your day.